You just need to have faith as a child. And I remember saying, but I'm an adult. <laughs> I'm not a child. And I have to answer these things to my child who's an adult. And it got pretty heated where I would come back and say something and they would basically say, you're not faithful enough. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're listening only and you would prefer to see our faces, head on over to my YouTube channel, Cults to Consciousness. And uh, it would mean a lot if you could hit that like button, subscribe, hit the bell so you get notified when we post new episodes. So today, is a really fun episode and everyone's gonna love this because you're gonna get an inside to my life but not only my life my mom's life so introducing lisa mama bear (laughs) hi welcome thank you (laughs) i'm a little nervous so it's okay to be nervous we're just gonna have a conversation and regular old chat stuff that we do all the time so what we're going to talk about, um, I really want to give the listeners an insight to the way that you grew up and how policies and doctrines have changed over time. Uh, so what your childhood looked like versus what my childhood looked like growing up with you, <clears throat> things that carried over, things that didn't, and essentially your story on how you ended up transitioning out of Mormonism and how you are now. Okay. Sounds good? Sounds good. I, I'm i actually really excited to hear your perspective on the way that you grew up, because I don't know if we've ever really talked about it, but I know that we come from a long, long line of Mormons. So Correct. what was that like growing up Mormon? And, and grandma and grandpa grew up Mormon too, right? Yes, correct. Um, well, basically, uh, my history goes clear back to when Heber C. Kimball was um, even baptized, and he was baptized by my grand, my great grandfather, mm. and so it. I was kind of just um, brought up as a Mormon, and I was a Mormon, and you didn't really talk about it that much. Um, we went to church every Sunday, and what I called it was mutual back then. Um, for some of you that don't know about the Young Women's Program, it which is it is called now, but it was mutual back then, and that was once a week. And I just went, and all of my friends and my family, uh, neighbors, everybody that I really was associated with was Mormon. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really discuss it that much. We just all knew we had to live it, and we did. Yeah, so how, I know there's quite a few rules. Did you follow all of the rules, and like, what were the rules back in those times? Yeah, back then it was kind of interesting because um, I was always afraid that you, I mean, you had to follow the rules. And so I am always, even now, a rule follower. And so I was kind of nervous knowing that um, you had to go to all your meetings, and if you didn't go, the guilt was really bad. And some, you know, Sundays I'd wake up and go, Oh, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And and maybe there were times that my parents weren't even going, but my sister would come in and say, "Come on, we got to go. We got to go." And you I mean go to church on Sunday. To church, and I kind of was like, "Oh, I really don't want to go today." And she would say, "You've got to go. You get up and go." And I listened, and I got up and went. Um, and I felt if I didn't, I felt guilty. We couldn't um, swim or play um, on Sunday. We had to basically go to church, come home, eat dinner, rest, uh, do our homework, or just stay around the house. We weren't really allowed to go out and, you know. You couldn't hang out with friends, right? No, uh, we didn't hang out with friends. We would sometimes go visit my parents' friends at their houses, but we still stayed within the rules of really not doing anything. We could never, uh, we weren't supposed to go on trips on Sunday, And Mm. so my family, we loved going to Lake Powell all the time. And so when we would go, I would get all excited that I got to miss Sunday. Yeah, I got to miss church. uh (laughs) And because I would say, it's because we're out of town. Yeah, That's the only reason why we're doing this. But a lot of people still encourage going to church even when you were out of town. Oh, yes. Finding a chapel. And I have done that. Yeah. Yeah. If you, Yellowstone, you would find the cabins that where they would hold the, the meetings even at cabins, they would have them. Or you would find a church building and you would go, which that was not fun as a kid. Because no, you kind of, when you were on vacation, you didn't want to have to go to church. 
But I remember one time being in Lake Powell and it was Sunday and my dad would just want to go for a ride in the boat because we lived on the boat, basically slept on it. And we would, I'd sit out on the bow of the boat and, and we would just fly through the canyons and just... I remember feeling so close to God right there. I would look at the beauty and see the, uh, I'd sing church hymns basically yeah. <laughs> on Sunday. That was my way of, I guess, saying yeah. it was okay. Yeah. But I, I did. I felt closer to God sometimes there than I ever did sitting in church. How was grandpa? Was he involved in the church? Uh, I don't ever remember him having callings. I, hmm. I don't. I remember my mom having callings. Um, in young women's and and things like that, and she, you know, but she worked a lot, so she was gone a lot of the time um, to work, and and then, but she, boy, she was a you know a faithful member and paid her tithing, and we all did, and we knew that that's what you did. I think one of the roles that makes me laugh now is the playing cards oh, thing. We could not play cards. We were not so face allowed. cards. Face right? cards. You you were not to play with face cards. And they were evil. And we were told they were evil. And I remember wanting to play cards because they're, you know, you some of my they're friends. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> some people that, you know, you would hear about them and you'd like, do we dare? Do we dare? And so we weren't allowed to really do that. You obviously we didn't drink caffeine or uh, no way coffee. Um, um which was kind of interesting because I remember them always saying you can't have hot drinks because the word of wisdom is say hot drinks. But yet we grew up in young women's or mutual of having hot chocolate. And so I always wondered why. I think that's the funny thing too is yeah. that <clears throat> they say, well, hot drinks is coffee and tea. and But they forget that chocolate has caffeine in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Because they're like, no, it's it's coffee and tea because of the caffeine but hot chocolate's okay and it's like hot and, and has coffee. caffeine it's <laughs> yeah, like it has the caffeine. hold on something's not adding <laughs> yeah, up yeah. so you always knew that you wanted to grow up and be a mom right mm -hmm. or was that just something that you were taught in mormonism is like you don't really no, have a choice? i always wanted to be a mom definitely good thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> look what i got <laughs> and two wonderful boys um no i i remember my grand I remember spending a lot of time at my grandma's house, which was kind of interesting as when I was young. And she was very religious. This was my mother's mother. And and my father's parents were, you know, really religious too. But I remember my grandfather wasn't. And he would sit out in the garage um, and smoke a pipe. <laughs> and I would go out and sit on his lap and he would blow the rings of smoke. Uh -huh. And I loved it. I would just sit out there and just sit with him. And my grandma would come out and, you don't do that in front of her. And you, you, you get in this house. <laughs> so I had to go in the house. So I couldn't really be around that. But I just remember feeling that bond with him. That was something that I enjoyed just sitting there with him. Yeah. Yeah. So then you got married when you were? I got married when I was 19. Which is pretty classic Mormon move. But. But. I. My whole growing up, I was told you get married in the temple. Yeah. And at the time, I was dating a, a man that wasn't a member of the church. And I remember going to my bishop and he said, um, you're getting married? And I said, yeah, I've met this wonderful guy. And he said, is he a member of the church? And I said, no. And he said, you should not marry him. And I was just devastated. I was like, but... I love this guy. And he said, no, he's not a member of the church. And I went home and I went and told him, I said, I'm not supposed to marry you, and but I want to. And he said, well, do you want me to join the church? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You have yeah. to join the church for you. And, and so I went back to my bishop and I said, no, I'm going to marry him. And so we got married, but not obviously not in the temple. And hmm. so... Um, Did you feel guilty about that? Oh, very much. Yeah. I, I felt guilty, but I was more angry that I felt this was a great guy. And he had great parents. And I just felt like that was, that was my decision. And so I'm sure that was... I don't know how if it was difficult for my parents. I, they didn't act hmm. like that. They didn't act like I was doing the wrong thing. And so... I just thought maybe one day we would go through the temple and 
Did you? I did, but not with him. Mm. We later divorced about seven years later, just knowing that we got married way too young. And he's a great guy, and he's married now and has a wonderful family, and and we all get along. And it's it's just, we were too young. And so when I did meet your father, um, we got married, not in the temple at first. And then it was a poolside wedding. It was a poolside, <laughs> yeah. It was a poolside wedding. And we then later um, went through the temple with you when you were born and you were, I think, uh, one, you were able to barely stand up on the, oh. up on the altar. You were dressed in all this cute little white. Of course, it was so cute. <laughs> <laughs> and but, at yeah. that point, you had Marcus and James, my brothers, yes, from your previous. Yes, from my previous. My ex-husband gave permission for my boys, your brothers, to get married, to be sealed to us mm. because he didn't really believe it, you yeah. know, so to him it was whatever, whatever. you know, whatever <laughs> you can do. It. And so we did. And so we all were there as a family and we all got sealed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. so so now you're raising me and I'm curious as to if anything carried over from your childhood that you really liked that your mom did or or maybe you just saw her as a great example because she was so active and in her leadership positions and that's essentially what you ended up doing you were always involved with something with the church always I uh, felt like I always had a calling and I my the funny thing was is I always, would say, I think the reason why they put me in a calling is that that's one way to get me to church. <laughs> because sometimes, you know, when you're not in a calling, you kind of tend to go, oh, should we go out of town? Should we maybe? Hold on. This we... is new information. <laughs> did you never actually want to go to church? No, I, there were times <laughs> when I didn't want to go to church because I was just maybe tired. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Because you get up in the morning and when, especially if church is at nine, mm -hmm. you have to get up and get the meals prepared for, to get in the crock pot or get in the oven and ready to turn on. Um, you had to get all three of you ready, all the, the two boys and you and get up and get going. And, and some days you were just exhausted and you were like, oh, I just don't want to go to church. But if you had a calling, you knew you had to go to church. So you would go. And once you were there, you know, it was okay. But Three hours was a long time, and by the time you got home, you were starving, and everybody was tired, and so it was a, a routine. And then sometimes you had meetings after church to prepare for the next meeting, and that, I felt guilty. I did feel guilty if I didn't. If you didn't go? Or if, if, didn't... I, if I didn't want to go, I felt guilty, and if I didn't go, I even felt worse, because if I went outside and the neighbors saw me, not at church. I didn't really associate, well, they're not in church either. <laughs> I would just think, oh, the neighbor saw me. Oh, oh, they're probably wondering why I wasn't at church. Yeah. And I think public perception was a huge thing growing up. Mm -hmm. It was where you sit even within the sacrament meeting. And so for those of you who don't know, church is three hours. They recently changed it to two because it's crazy. But you had one hour everyone together called sacrament meeting where you would pass the sacrament mm -hmm. or other Christians known as communion. And then the second half or the second hour for kids, if you were under a certain age, you go to primary. And then you also had another Sunday school. Sunday school. Sunday school. Yeah. So there were three different sections, mm -hmm. which for a kid, that's a really long time for anyone. Mm -hmm. That's a really yeah. long time, yeah. especially because we were so busy during the week with Baseball games, football games, basketball games, mm -hmm. and then my dance recitals, practices, whatever, right. homework. And then you add on church and then you add on mutual, which was on Wednesdays, which I think I always went to for yeah. the most part. Mm -hmm. You did. Yeah. Because yeah. I was pretty excited yeah. once I turned 13, 12. Yeah. Once I turned 12, I was like, yeah. oh, I'm not a baby anymore. Now I get to be with the <laughs> cool kids because she was a leader and I wanted to be involved because she always had really fun activities with us. Um so, yeah, how was yeah. that for you being so involved with all of the activities? Did you enjoy it? Was it just too much? Um, I did enjoy it. I mean, we had a, a great, what we called ward. Our ward was really good, and I had a lot of good friends in the ward. And I was, you know, involved in the Young Women program. And, of course, and you were getting of the age when, you know, you were able to go. And that was always fun being around these young women. And they just thought you were fun and <laughs> you would do activities. And I would try to 
you know, do activities that were centered around things that they would love to learn about. Uh, you know, we would do, you know, things on hair and, and clothing oh, yeah. and, um, we would have these different events and we'd all get together and we'd talk about the modesty and how you're supposed to not show your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> sinner, you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and how you were to, you know, act. Um, we do things on etiquette, Oh yeah. you know, invite the boys to do it and the girls to do it. And they would teach them how to Pull hold out chair. the chair, for, yeah, hold the chair for the boy for the girls, and then you know how to sit at a table, what fork to use, that kind of thing. Yeah. I remember a lot of lessons centered around becoming a wife and becoming a mom. Oh, like, definitely. So many. I feel like it was half the lessons was like, you want to get married in the temple one day, and you can get married outside of the temple, but it's not going to be as good. And the funny thing is now I talk to people who get married in the temple or got married in the temple who have left the church, and they're like, it was so awful. I cried the whole day, or like I didn't know that it was going to be this weird, and no one prepared me for that. And yeah. the ceremony itself was just like I'm supposed to swear fealty to my husband, and he swears fealty to God, and it was – just not like the ceremony that we were dreaming of right. or that we've been preparing yeah. for in all of these classes. So was the you you had both of your weddings outside of the temple, but you went back into temple work pretty frequently, right? Or when you could? When I got married in the temple, you know, when I got married in the temple and sealed to you kids, yeah. that was the temple ceremony. Okay. Um and it wasn't as exciting as a regular wedding and it you didn't it didn't have the glamour of it or you're dressed in with the hats and the, the apron I mean it you don't feel pretty at all yeah. you don't feel like a pretty bride at all but I was really wanting to go through the temple so I really truly believed that I was doing the right thing and this is what I wanted to do I mean my whole youth growing up like you say in young women's it was you were destined to marry someone in the temple has to be a return missionary all of these rules need to be followed and when I didn't follow those I felt like am I missing something I need that temple in my life I need mm. I feel like that's what I needed and so that's what I was striving for so when I got married in the temple I remember being in there looking at my mother like leaning over to her what is it what what are they doing? What's going what they... on here? And it was always, shh, got to be quiet. You can't talk about it. And I well, I have all these questions just rolling through my head. And I thought, well, I'll talk about it later. Well, then you get in the celestial room and it's just beautiful and peaceful. And I would lean over to ask my husband at the time a question. And I was told, no, you can't talk. You have to be quiet and respectful of those that are praying and I'm thinking, but I have all these questions I need answered. Who's going to answer them? And then I'd get home and say, okay, I've got some questions. I need to talk. And then it was, remember, we can't talk about it outside, outside of, the temple. of the temple. And I was like, well, then when do you talk about it? When do you have all those questions answered? So I would go to the temple over and over and over again, hoping that the answers would just come to me from up God. above. Yeah. And that didn't happen. It just didn't happen. And... That was frustrating. I think that's one of the things that they have going for them is is the they say it's it's not secret, it's sacred. Yet like you said, you have all of these questions and it's just like a loop because you can never get them answered. No. You can't talk about it. And in fact, the the temple ceremony practice that was removed, which you never had to do, but your mom right. had told you about mm -hmm. it, where you would make the motion of mm -hmm. slitting your throat and slitting out your bowels saying, basically saying, I covenant that if I disclose what goes on in the temple, I will slit my own throat. Like, right. that's really extreme. <laughs> and I did not have to do that, thank goodness, because I think that would have really shocked me. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was frustrated that I couldn't talk to my own husband about what was going on in the temple when I felt like I needed these questions answered. And they said, just, you got to keep going to the temple. The more you go, the more you go, the more you go, you'll get those answers. And, and I went faithfully. Mm -hmm. I went at times when I was so stressed because I had to pick you kids up at a certain time. And I'd say, okay, but I've got this much time. I'm going to go. And I would go in and just say, please, God, just take care of my family while I'm at, in the temple. 
because I can't be there. And I was so worried, you know, that I needed to be there at a certain time or if something happened. And Well, that's really ironic <laughs> that <clears throat> you go to the temple to pray for safety instead of just actually being there for your family. <laughs> I was praying that my family would be okay because I'm doing the Lord's work. And so please yeah. watch over my family. And you would get out and you'd hurry and grab your phone and look to see, did I miss something? And a lot of times it would be, where were you? I've been trying to call you. And yeah. I was at the temple and I couldn't, you know. I think that's one of the things I wanted to talk about too is how... Um, the number one priority, or at least they say, is family, yet they create all these scenarios that pull you away from your family. So like temple work, where you're just going and doing these ritualistic things mm -hmm. that really have no benefit to you immediately, right? right? It's, it's mm -hmm. supposed to be like a spiritual blessing thing. And then you're doing all these meetings and all these activities that's pulling you away from the thing that you're supposed to be spending time with. Right. I I felt like as a as a young mom and a member of the church you had to be the perfect wife, the perfect mother, the perfect homemaker, the perfect leader in the church calling. Everything about you had to be perfect and we're not perfect. And the strain on that and the the guilt and shame you feel if your house is messy because you had to go take your kids to their ball game and or you had to miss young women's because you wanted to go to a ball game or a dance recital and the guilt you felt like well we're all about family but yet i can i'm not spending time with my family i felt bad for the bishop's family right it's because even worse he's never there with his family but yet everything centered around the family and making sure that it's forever family, mm -hmm. your family suffers. Did you ever suffer from like the, the toxic perfectionism when it comes to physical appearance? Because it seems like there's like a, a standard in Utah that almost everyone tends to look alike eventually. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I don't really know how that is or why that is, but well, we know that missionaries are told the more righteous they are, the hotter their wife will be. <laughs> so you think, well, I got to be super hot to get the most righteous dude. But it's just like this underlying thing where everyone feels like they have to look perfect. Mm -hmm. Not only mm -hmm. look perfect, but their family, like you said, has to be in mm -hmm. perfect order. So what was that like for you? Again, the you have to be perfect and your hair has to be done all the time, makeup, um, you would make sure your kids are all, their clothes are all clean and they're per I mean, you want to do that anyway, but it became that fear of, oh, you've, you're putting on this show for everyone. When you would walk, and it's kind of interesting, before you go to church, it's chaos in your house, chaos. You know, get upstairs, you got to eat, you got to get your clothes on, get this, we got to iron this. Everything is nonstop. And then you're yelling at your kids to hurry and get in the car because you got to get to church on time. And <laughs> everybody's, it's just chaotic. And then you get in the car and then you get to church and then you all walk in. Hi, hi, we're all here. Oh, we're all good here. to see oh, you. Oh, it's so great. <laughs> and yet you know that you're not the only one that has gone through that. Everybody uh -huh. there. And yet I always wished you could just walk in and go, oh, Man, here we are. This was a crazy morning. And you walk know? in with jeans. Uh huh. And but yeah. you have to wear dresses mm -hmm. and suits and ties and, and look perfect. And your kids have to look perfect, or at least that's how you felt, mm -hmm. or that's that was the expectation the guilt that I probably put on myself because you felt you had to put that out there. And and I'm not the only one that felt it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand now why there are so many women that. Um, are on prescription, you know, medicine. And it's because they're stressed with dealing with having to keep up with this, you know, this look, this uh, perfection. And I, I can see it's scary. And the energy level that's required to oh, make yeah. all of those things mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm curious what your experience with garments were. So let me explain. <laughs> So garments, um, some people outside of the church call them magic underwear, uh, but they are a very like sacred thing to people in the church. And essentially they cover your shoulders, um, 
cover your thighs to make sure that you're dressing modestly. They're supposed to protect you. They have certain symbols on them that represent different things that I think you learned in the temple, mm -hmm. um, which I found out later was just Masonic symbols <laughs> that mm -hmm. Joseph Smith borrowed. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really hard for women because, you know, most things don't cover your shoulders, like especially in the summer when you live somewhere hot. Like when I lived in Vegas and everyone's like, I have to wear this basically an undershirt and full length shorts under everything. And so I'm curious if you noticed your parents wearing them and how they changed when you wear them and how they've changed to what they are now. <laughs> I remember seeing my parents in their garments. Their garmies. Their garmies. And I remember as a child going, oh, oh. <laughs> Those are not very appealing. Yeah. I mean, I just remember thinking, oh, it just didn't look good. And when it came time for me to wear them, of course, I had to give up a lot of my clothes before I went through the temple because they were short sleeved, no sleeves, or they weren't a higher neck. You had some tubes in there, some I, tube tops. Yeah. <laughs> I had some, some. I had some 80s tubes. And some, you know, the little shorter dresses and whatnot, but... And I remember giving those away willingly because I knew I was going through the temple and I got the, the garments. And I, when I first, I remember putting the garments on, I felt, oh, they're just, oh, Like protection. a warm hug? Yeah, just, oh, I just feel so great in them. And then as time went on, I would look at myself in the mirror and go, Oh, how? And I, this is not attractive. How does my husband even think I'm attractive? Because they're they're not. Wait, the funny. <laughs> you probably so, remember seeing me in them. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so I think the funniest thing to see was <laughs> you have to put your bra on the outside. <laughs> And it's sliding. It's moving up and so down. So you have like a, like imagine a really thin cotton t-shirt with a bra over it. <laughs> and you can't wear underwear under the shorts either. So like the no. long, like almost like long johns to long your knees no, and, are the underwear. And so mine went to my calf. Several of them did. To your calf? We had two different styles. Ones that went to the calf and the others that went to the knee. Now that's changed. They're not, I actually preferred sometimes the longer ones because when you had um, longer knee pants. length shorts on, you were constantly trying to pull them down because they would kind of creep up. Mm -hmm. And so you're pulling them down. But if you had the longer ones and you had pants on, jeans on, they would stay down better. But you were dying of heat. Mm. Visualize going to a ball game and it's 102 degrees and you're sitting outside with these garments on. Now, then they came clear to here. Yeah, I remember now, that. Now I believe they're more here. Uh -huh. And the neckline was straight across. And now it cuts down. I've seen some now and I go, Dude, wow, man, I wished I would have had those then. <laughs> that would have been much better. But I, I really respected them. And while I was in the temple, I did respect them. And when I ended up not wearing them when I left, um, I still was respectful of them. And mm -hmm. to, because you did feel that sacredness that you didn't want to, I guess, be shamed or struck by lightning um, because you didn't properly dispose of them. So I was careful with that um, out of respect to the church. And, and Yeah. So I was wondering if there was any time where you felt really restricted with the garments or the rules specifically. Um, and the reason I bring that up, and I guess I'll, I'll start with a quick story and then you can tell me if you can relate to this, but um, most people don't know I'm a tailor for cost, or I'm a costumer for film and TV and um, commercials. So <clears throat> I tailor clothes for a living <laughs> for one of my many things. And um, I was just recently doing a game show and I won't say which one, but you know, we, we did like 50 contestants and we were just nonstop fitting them. And, and this, uh, this sister pair came in and the second they opened their mouth, I was like, you're from Utah, are you? Because <laughs> it's really, it's really easy to pick up the accent, but, um, they were, and I was like, okay, cool. And I noticed that, um, they were wearing garments, which is totally fine. We were respectful of that. And we wanted to make sure that they were comfortable and whatever we put them in, that it was long enough. And um, 
everything seemed fine and we went through all the options and we took photos and we said if there's anything you don't like just tell us now we won't even include it with the producers and so it comes to the shoot day and i'm back at the hotel doing more alterations and they call me to set to do something on one of them and when i get there tensions are high (laughs) and all of the costumers are fuming and i'm like okay something's going on here uh and i just had a suspicion i was like i bet you there's something going on with the wardrobe with those sisters and it turns out they the the network so the highest of high like they're the ones that make all the decisions they had chosen a dress for her and she said i refuse to wear that and she was just i will not and all of us were like but you have to (laughs) because (laughs) the network chose it and that's what they want for you and it was a long it was like an accordion fold beautiful color it looked great on her Mm -hmm. um and yeah, so when I went back and looked at it later, I was like, I bet you I know why she wouldn't wear it because it was very slinky. And I remember her saying to me in the fitting, um, well, I I don't have to wear my garments while I'm on stage for those few hours, but it needs to look like I'm wearing them. And so I'm thinking like, okay. And she's like, I'm just worried that if something were to come up and they saw my garments, that would be embarrassing or if they came up and realized they weren't there, that's even worse. Hmm. So when I saw this dress, I was like, it's pretty bouncy. And it's probably a situation where if she were to jump and her skirt went up a little bit just above the knee and people saw that she wasn't wearing her garments, it would have been this huge deal. And I don't know her backstory and the deal with her family and friends, so I can't speak to that. I can only speculate. But it just threw this whole wrench into this multi-million dollar production all because of these (laughs) these underclothes and so uh i i can't tell the outcome of the show but i'll say it wasn't great (laughs) it was not a great outcome and i thought to myself well she probably blamed herself and felt guilty guilty. for taking them off and that's why things went Mm -hmm. awry so i'm curious if anything like that has happened to you or if you've had any experiences where you felt like either you wanted to take them off or you took them off and felt guilty and something bad happened and you blamed yourself (laughs) i for me there were times when when we like one time we went to hawaii and I How old were you at this point? I was older, married. Married with older. me? No, yes. Old, I mean, you were old. Oh, you were older. okay. And I remember it was when I was not wanting to wear them anymore. But I knew I had to. To keep up appearances to with keep the up family. Appearances. And I had to wear them because of the family. Because they didn't know I had was considering, you know, leaving. And so I remember thinking, well, we're in Hawaii. If I just am in my swimsuit all the time. That's the biggest loophole. <laughs> Because <laughs> then I knew, okay, I'm okay. So I wore my swimsuit most of the time. I'd get up, put it on, put well, I'm just you know, going to the shorts beach. over top, and <laughs> hey, I'm just ready for that beach. Yeah. And it was sad because I should have been able to just go, no, I'm not. And I finally did come to that, you know, realization down the road that this is who I am. And if people don't love me for who I am, then that's that's not my problem. And Yeah, but that's something that I want to speak to as well, because people who aren't raised in a high demand religion um, or any type of group or organization that has these type of rules, it's really hard to understand why it's so difficult to just take them off or why it's so difficult Mm -hmm. to just tell your friends, like, I don't believe it anymore, because it's so much more than just a place you go on Sundays. I think I may have said this before on the podcast. It's an identity. It's... Mm -hmm your entire family's salvation is wrapped up in your decision. Yeah. So they tell you it's salvation is like a chain. And if my mom were to break that chain, then not only is she ruining her salvation, she's ruining mine because I'm her kid. And so there's so much tied up in that. And I want to just get your perspective on what it was like when you finally did tell your family members who were still believing that you were leaving and how that affected you. It was interesting because my mother actually left the church before I did. Before all of us. Before all of us. And I remember wondering why. I was still in it quite heavily. And I remember why is... She never said she's left. She just quit going. Um, And I would think, 
why? And I remember she said to me, this is my journey and this is my, my path and yours is yours. And you need to research yourself mm-hmm. if you want to know. Because I said, just tell me why. <laughs> what am I not answers. knowing? Because what I had been taught my whole life from her and from my leaders in the church that it was the truth and you don't sway. And But when she left, I couldn't figure out why. And so I just thought, well, she's still my mom and I love her and that's not going to change. And so when I was um, leaving... I remember thinking, how do I tell people the guilt? You know, I I told your brothers, and you know they they handled it really well. They go, we we knew you were done. We knew you were done. But I was so afraid to tell people for fear that I would lose friends, which I did. Mm-hmm. I did. I lost a lot of my friends, and I lost a lot of acquaintances. The really good friends, they they didn't care. They to this day, still treat me the same. I treat them the same, and whether they're in it or not, and a lot of them are, and I love them for who they are, but they love me. But the ones that were more judgmental, they, I guess I didn't need them as friends, you know? Yeah, because you find out who they are. That's not what you know, a true friend does. But then it's so true, like on that, on one hand, it makes complete sense that if you really love someone, you would stick by them no matter what. On the other hand, we were raised to believe that if you associate with people who are against mm, the church, that's then that's right. going to affect your salvation, even just associating with them. So mm-hmm. it's really hard and you want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but you also want to be like, okay, like, come on, let's have some common mm-hmm. sense or common decency at least right. to see through that. But it's really hard for people. Right. And, you know, and one of the things <clears throat> that they ask you when you're getting your temple recommend is are you associating with anyone outside of the ch- religion? And oh, wow. you have to answer that. And I'd say, well, I have friends. <laughs> yes, I live in the world. <laughs> I, I have friends that are not LDS. And but they go, but do you associate with them? Do you study with them? Do you? And I go, no, they're just my friends. And so that was a really mm-hmm. difficult thing for me because I felt like shouldn't you have friends in all religions because. It shouldn't matter. It, if, it shouldn't. If the church is true, it should be able to be studied. It should be able to be fact checked. It should be able. You should be able to associate with anyone that you want. And I, you know, my gosh, do you remember this? Okay, so we were in the car. I was in high school, so I had moved to Portland with them. It was just me. My brothers had already graduated, and this was the first thing. And and you can watch on my episode where I talk about episode one, where. I started getting asked all these weird questions because I was no longer in Utah. And I was like, mom, they're asking me the weirdest stuff. Like, does Joseph Smith put his head in a hat to translate? I'm like, this is insane, right? Like, we would, because we didn't know. And um, I remember driving home from school one day with you, and I was invited to this Christian summer camp. And it was epic they had like bouncy slides <laughs> they had like zip lining it was i mean our girls camp was pretty cool but this was like girls camp on steroids <laughs> it was like adventure park and then you know they would have the pastors and give messages and a lot of kids in my school were a part of it like mm-hmm. the cool kids mm-hmm. and i wanted to be a cool kid and i was the mormon <laughs> kid <laughs> but but i remember i was like mom do you think I could go? It cost like $700. But of course, my my friend who was trying to convert me at the time was like, oh, I bet we can get it sponsored. You know, they'd <laughs> get it paid for. Okay. And so you said something to me like, well, are you sure you want to go to something like that of a different religion? And like, how would you feel about that? And I was like, mom, <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. I was like, mom, uh. I have the whole truth and no matter where i go and what church i attend they don't have the whole truth i just have additional information that they don't have Mm -hmm. so i can go and learn about jesus and that's fine because you know mormons Mm -hmm. claim that they're christian Mm -hmm. even though it's a pretty different theology Mm -hmm. and uh i was like i can learn about jesus but i also know about joseph smith (laughs) And you were like, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I, and I truly believe that. Yeah. I thought, well, you're right. You're yeah. going there. You're going to be an example. You're going to <laughs> missionary bring them moment. over. This is because you're taught. If you're, you're a missionary, no matter what age, mm-hmm. and 
you know if you bring someone to the church, that's one more brick for your ho- mansion in heaven. And so I thought, you're going to go, and it's okay. You can go. And and I I really felt confident enough in our religion that you're going to go and realize. And my testimony, yeah, too, that, right? Because yeah. I was like you the were, valiant one. Really I was were. like all about church yeah, and really I read my scriptures yeah. all the time. I was even considering going to BYU. That's right. And you were That's like, right. why, why do you want to go to BYU? I was <laughs> like, well, mom, in order for me to find a good return missionary who's hot, I have to go to Utah because they're going to be everywhere. But if I go somewhere else, like it's going to be slim pickings. <laughs> Spoiler spoiler alert, I did not go to the fun uh, girls camp on steroids, and I did not go to BYU. So, (laughs) but lucky for me, I did not go to BYU because ended up in Vegas, and that's where I started deconstructing. And that's when I started coming to you and was like, okay, I have this binder of questions. She's Mm -hmm. the organized one, and she taught me how to be very type A and like have lists and cross things off and make notes in the margin. So that's what I did when I started researching all of these things that were initially brought up to me when I was in Portland. Mm -hmm. And I was like, just going to put that to the side. You know, I'm almost 18. I don't want want to deal with a faith crisis or identity crisis. So I put it off to the side. Um, And then, yeah, I, I got it brought up again in Vegas. And I was like, you know, I'm going to look into it this time. And so I came to you with these questions. And so what was it like when I'm coming to you asking you all these things that you don't know the answers to? Well, at first I was like, oh, we bring them. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer these for you. And then I would look at them and go, I don't know. I, but I'll find out. Mm -hmm. I'll find out. So I would talk to my home teacher and say, look, I've got these questions that were asked by my daughter and I need to answer them for her. And I can't, can you help me? And he'd go, I'm not sure. Uh, but you have faith. And I go, yeah, I do. And he goes, well, listen, I'll, I'll talk to the bishop. He would come back again and he'd say, this is what the bishop states that you just need to have faith as a child. And I remember saying, but I'm an adult. (laughs) I'm not a child. And I have to answer these things to my child who's an adult. How do I answer them? And they couldn't. Mm -hmm. And I even had uh, the state president come to my house, him and it was another gentleman. I don't know if he was in the bishopric or, but he, they, they too, they came. My husband was not home, which that's a no, no. That is. Yeah. I don't know how they did because I remember opening the door going you're not supposed to be here my husband was out of town at the time and working out of town and they came in and started I started asking them questions and they couldn't answer them and I said I'm kind of frustrated because I can't answer these questions and they just said again you have to have faith and it got pretty heated where I would come back and say something and they would basically say you're not faithful enough you don't (sighs) You, you're not able, if you can't just have faith and believe that, and I'd say, but, and I would bring up different points and they would, it would be a debate. And I finally looked over at my wall and I had a picture of Christ on the wall. And I looked at that and I thought, would Christ be standing in my house right now, allowing this to happen, an argument between two men and one woman and all She's just asking questions. And I thought, what would Christ do here? And I stood up and I said, this is not a place. This is my home. And I don't feel this is right. You're going to have to leave. And I said, I don't think Christ would be happy if he was here right now. They were kind of shocked. But I basically walked to the door and opened the door and said, this is for you to leave. And they did. They left. Like a boss. (laughs) (laughs) I was was shaking. When oh, they geez. left, I remember calling my husband saying, first of all, I can't what believe just they happened. were there. Yeah. And that they came, and I didn't have you home with me. Yeah. And I felt alone. I felt kind of like bullied and just kind of, you know, it was like me against them. Which is crazy for them to not only not have any answers to your questions, but saying, well, you're wrong because you just need to have faith. Mm-hmm. Like you, you need yeah. to just do better. I'm like, no, just answer my question and it'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. But the thing is, no one has the answers. So like no matter how far up you go, they're not going to be able to answer it. 
Where you can answer it, though, is in the church history books. Yes. And you can see exactly what went down. And that's when you start going into rabbit holes. and ra- I mean, the questions that we're talking about are stuff like, why are there multiple versions of the first vision? Right. So yeah. we would ask someone like, well, I don't think there are mil- multiples. And then there it's like, are. well, there are. And the version that was canonized and used was 13, a, I think. 13, it, was, 13. it wasn't the first or the last. No, they like just like picked mm-hmm. one in the middle. Yeah. And they were all pretty vastly different generally the same story and and it was something that that joseph smith didn't even write down until he decided to found the church years later Mm -hmm. so he had this vision when he was 14 and he started the church and he was like 30 or something and so we're going well if that's the whole thing that the church is supposed to be founded on seeing jesus and god you think that that would be, you wouldn't forget, <sighs> and you would write it down immediately, and you would tell everyone, and it would be a really big deal, but it only became relevant when it was helpful for him. <laughs> well, so. And do you remember those blocks that they had uh, that said search, ponder, and pray? Oh my gosh, the blocks. We had it. I When <laughs> you were blocks. growing up, we made them in Relief Society Was activity. it like the vinyl letters or something? Yes. Or you would paint uh-huh. it? You'd paint the block and then you'd put the vinyl letters. One would say search, one would say ponder, one would say pray. And so I really believe that, search, ponder, and pray. And so when I would ask these questions, I would say, are we supposed to search, ponder, and pray? And they said, yes. And I go, okay, well, I want to search and read these other books and get on the internet and no, no, no. You are to read what is at Deseret Book. Which and is what a church, church owned yes, bookstore. And what the church puts out. Um, when I was teaching young women's going back to that, I wanted, you had to follow the manual. So no matter where you went around the world, everybody was doing that same lesson out of that same manual. And I would say, but I kind of want to tie in Jesus Christ and talk about him because we're the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. And they'd say, well, no, the lesson's on Joseph Smith. And I go, I know, but what I have these activities I want to kind of bring in about Christ and how his, the love and, and everything that he talked about, because to me, that was the most important thing was, you know, the love. I had to follow the manual, had to follow it. And so I felt like, where's the search, pondering and praying? You should be able to look at everything and then decide from that. Mm-hmm. It's um, information control. See the bite model by Dr. Stephen Hassan, which talks about um, cult-like organizations. They control your information so that it's basically you're in this bubble and you don't realize that something else is going on outside because you're not looking. So that was something else that I wanted to talk about is people people look at mormons and they're like these people are nuts right like they believe that this guy dug up some plates that were etched in and he, and he translated them by putting his head into a hat and you get your own planet if you're good and like become a god it's kind of blasphemous according to christianity really mm-hmm. but the but mormons and i know this because i was one of them look at scientologists and we're like these people are nuts like they believe that there's an alien god named xenu and there's like thetans attached to them and like everything it's so easy to see when you're not in it and so i wanted to talk about Mm. how normal people regular people smart people very intelligent people get caught up in these things uh, either one, because they were born and raised in it, and that's all that they know, yeah. or two, because they're not given all of the information, and they go in with this very pretty clean-cut version of Mormonism that they think that they're getting, and they just don't realize the history or or what actually happened with Joseph Smith and all of his wives and, and things that are very unsavory that they wouldn't want the missionaries right. to be teaching. So yeah. I wanted to get your perspective on that because like we, you said, when you moved to Portland, people were like asking you if you had horns and stuff and you're like, what? Yeah, I was <laughs> like, in shock. Well, and going back to that, like you're saying, when I was young, I was a Mormon. You lived it, you breathed it, you never talked about it because everyone that you associated with was Mormon. So mm-hmm. you just all did just it. Just went with it. You never questioned anything. And when I finally moved to Oregon and was around amazing people from so many different religions, and they started saying, oh, where are you from? 
Utah. Utah. And that's the first question that comes up. Are you Mormon? And uh-huh. I'd say, yes. And they would say, oh, well, tell me a little bit about your church. Or they started asking me questions. And I'm like, bring it. I'm yeah. ready. And they would ask me questions and I'd go, I have no idea. This is so bad that I don't know my own religion. Or I would state a fact and they'd say, no, I don't think so. That's not what we were told. Then they would say something to me. I'd go home and start trying to find the answers like, am I wrong? And again, I was only, when you're in the church, you're only given the answers that the church wants you to know. Mm -hmm. I was studying about Emma Smith. And reading a lot of her books and Emma Joseph Smith, Smith is Joseph Smith's wife for her his original his wife. original wife because I knew that you know with polygamy I being a member of the church I always said uh uh-uh, uh I could not live that law and they said well when you die and you go to heaven you'll all live it and you'll and I go but if <laughs> if I am who I am right now and I go to heaven I'm not gonna want to do that so am I going to hell because I. I can't do that. And they say, it'll all be worked out when you get there. And in my head, I'm like, I'm not going to agree to that. (laughs) Your mind will change. Your heart will soften. You will will do that. And I kept thinking, no, I don't think so. And, But I felt that um, that feeling of knowing that I can't do that. So I thought, well, let me study about how Emma felt. Mm -hmm. Maybe she's got something that's going to make me see it, you know, that, that I'll go, okay, I can do it. But the books I would read about her, I would think, yeah, you know, she's really not questioning it as much as, as I thought she would until I started looking at other books. That weren't written that by were Mormons. were not written by Mormons. And then I started to see what she was saying and how she felt when Joseph Smith was uh, killed. I thought, well, she believes in the church 100%. She's going to go to Utah with Brigham Young. No, she didn't. And I thought... Why wouldn't she go with the church? If she saw those plates or she was a witness of to those, mm-hmm. why wouldn't she go? That she wanted the the answer I was given was she wants to be where her husband's body was buried. That well, wasn't And then you find out later that her witnessing the plates where she went to the place where the plates were supposedly buried and she was forced to turn around while Joseph Smith dug them up and put them into a log to come back and get later. She never actually yeah, saw yeah. them. So, and she started her own church. So, yeah. <laughs> But we're not taught that. Yeah. We're not taught that and until you start what I believe is truth that the church said, search, ponder, and pray. But it should be to search, ponder, and pray everything mm-hmm. from every religion and, and then, you know, make that decision. What's best for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. So... I remember the phone conversation of you and dad coming out to me. <laughs> Do you remember this? You're going to tell you you tell it. I was going to tell it. I was probably all nervous about telling yeah. you. Yeah. So I was living in Vegas at the time going to school and it was probably 6 months to a year after I deconstructed where I was like, yeah, this sucks. And then I found out all of the information and the backstory, the true history. And I was like, oh yeah, it's made up. I'm out. So I think I was like 20. Yeah, I was probably 19 or 20. And so I get a, a phone call from both of them and, you know, they're on speaker and they go, we just want to, we want to talk to you for a minute. And I'm like, okay, what's up? And <laughs> well, we just wanted to let you know that we haven't really been going to church and um, we've decided to take off our garments and it's not for us anymore, but we know how strong your testimony is and if you want to get married in the temple, we, we will do anything it takes to be there. I mean, we bless them. Lie. Bless them for that. <laughs> like, lie to the bishop no. so they can go to my temple wedding. Because I was not going to miss that. So. I don't know why I hadn't clued them in that I was already out, but maybe I was scared of what they were going to say about me. I don't remember. But I was like, oh, no, you're fine. I like I bounced a while ago. And they're like, oh, okay, (laughs) okay, cool. Do you want to talk about this? (laughs) Because it was a lot of your questions that made me question. Mm -hmm. When you would come to me before about all those questions about the church and I couldn't answer them, then you'd just leave for Vegas and leave us hanging with all these questions Mm -hmm. to where I had to start doing my own research and start going, whoa, 
Yep. Yeah. So we were independently deconstructing uh-huh. and we didn't realize yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of temple recommends, like what it takes to actually be able to go to the temple. And, and real quick, so oh, yeah. for people who don't realize or know, um, in order to get to the highest level of the the Mormon heaven, I guess you could call it, or celestial in their or case, the, yeah. it's just heaven, um, the celestial kingdom, you have to go to the temple and you have to, it's like baptisms for the dead and doing temple work for people who have died. So essentially like forcing dead people to get baptized and accept your church <laughs> um, and go watch this movie. It's like a three hour thing, right? A, a it, couple hours? No, I think it's about an hour and a half total. That, total. Okay. Yeah, uh, total. Yeah. Okay. And you're expected to do this often because it's up to the Mormons to baptize everyone who's ever lived in existence so that they can all go and to then, the right heaven. Yeah. So in order to go to the temple, you have to get a temple recommend. And in order to get that, you have to go and do a bishop's interview. And he asks all of these questions, which, by the way, you start doing these bishop's interviews at age 12, where mm-hmm. you're asked questions about your sexuality. Religion. You're asked, yeah, if you're if you're being good or if you're following your parents, if you're following the laws of the land, like all of these things that no 12-year-old needs to be answering, right? Like, yeah. So anyway, once you get to the age where you're allowed to go to the temple, which usually they don't let women go unless they get married. Or and, go on a mission. Or go on a mission. And men get it when they're like 19 because most of them go on a mission. Or they can get it sooner. It's just a lot harder for women to get their endowments without being married or going on a mission. Mm-hmm. A single woman. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> um, this story has always really stuck out to me. And I've probably told it a billion times. But now you're here. So now you can tell the story of when you were in Oregon and you wanted to get your temple recommend and the things that the bishop was saying to you. Is this the story about... About... What? You being a sinner. Okay. Okay. (laughs) A sinner in quotes. Okay. I (laughs) felt like I was... I mean, I was following the word of wisdom because that's what you're supposed to do. And again, that's no no coffee, no... um, Tea. Tea. um, Tobacco. Right. uh, Weed. Yeah, yeah, no drugs. drugs. You, I mean, really live healthily, and which is good in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Um, but I used to always wonder about that too, because I'm like, man, chocolate has so much caffeine in it, but yet, what about all the sweets? Well, and you that- can also drink energy drinks. Yeah, yeah. They don't say anything yeah. about energy drinks or you know the sodas with 25 grams yeah, of sugar in them, right. but coffee and tea but, are a no go. Yeah. So I remember going, and when I um, I was I had had back surgery in 2007 and so and it was major back surgery I mean it was a pretty intense one and I was on some pain medication which was horrible and I had him in my purse and and I remember going to my bishop's interview and he said so are you following you know are you associated with anybody outside of the church are you going to all your meetings because you have to go to all your meetings are you paying your tithing um, are you living the word of wisdom? And I hesitated for a minute and I said, well, I am doing all of those things, except I drink coffee once in a while because it's, my doctor told me it would help with my digestion because of the, pain all the medication that I was taking. And, and he goes, Oh no, you can't be drinking coffee. And I, I was just like, but my doctor told me I need to do this, that this, re- and it does help me. And he said, no, you can't. I was devastated. And I sat there and I reached down, grabbed in my purse, and I grabbed my bottle of pain medicine. (laughs) Oxy. And set it on the desk. And I said, but I can have these? And he said, oh, yeah, they're a prescription, so you can have those. That's fine. And I said, no matter how many I take, I can take this whole bottle right now. And that's okay? Okay even though the dangers of what would happen if I took this whole bottle, but I can't have a cup of coffee. And he kind of just sat there and looked at me and he goes, well, okay, just don't tell anyone. (laughs) And I, I looked at him and I go, what? And he goes, no. Okay. I grabbed the bottle and put it back in my purse. And I sat there and I go, so it's okay. I can drink coffee for that reason. And he goes, yes, but just don't tell anyone. I walked out of there more upset because I felt like 
I, because I challenged him with something that I felt was right. I mean, I wasn't taking it to just because I wanted to drink it all the time. I was taking it because it was helped me. But I thought, what about the person that went in there that didn't challenge that? They couldn't go to the temple. Yeah. That, that wasn't right. So I felt like what you can tell me how to do one thing, but if I went to a different bishop, they might flat out say, no way. Mm-hmm. You, that just, I felt like, are you getting this from God? Or it just didn't sit well. Yeah, I love that you challenged him and then was mad when he, when he accepted mad the challenge. He, <laughs> and even though I was grateful because I could go to the temple, yeah. but yet I, it really put a bad taste in my mouth that that just isn't... Well, and also, right. if you're someone who does go to the temple often and and you you know, you you want to get your temple recommend, let's say, to see someone that you love get married. So you want to make sure to keep up those Mm -hmm. appearances Mm -hmm. too, because if, let's say, your niece were to get engaged and want to get married in the temple. I've been there. Where you can't go. I couldn't go. go. I could not go. There you go. go. I could not go. My hypothetical was a real (laughs) situation. And I sat in the lobby of the temple, Mm. and that's embarrassing. Yeah. When you feel like you're a good person, and you really are a good person, and you care about people and you care about them and yet you can't go in you're deemed unworthy by this random bishop and you're looked at like has flexible rules and so i was also i remembered that time because i was there with you when we went to the storehouse to get your garments because you can only buy them from the church it's like the self-fulfilling machine you have to wear your garments but you can only buy it from them and they're pretty pricey too Mm -hmm. right I mean, yeah, I mean, because you want to keep them very nice, so you go through them quite yeah. often. Yeah. 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 And so from my perspective, I'm sitting in the car, and she just comes back bawling, empty-handed. And I'm like, what happened in there? Because I was probably like 13 or 14 or something. Yeah. And she says, I can't get my garments because my temple recommend just barely expired. Like, Barely, like within a couple weeks, and I got all the way in there. I order all my sizes that I need, and they bring it all to the front, and there's a whole line of people. And right then, she goes, okay, do you have your recommend? I pull it out and hand it to her, and she goes, oh, no, this is expired. You cannot get these. I was mortified because everybody turned and looked at me. Mm -hmm. And I remember just going, but it's just barely expired. You know, can I not? I mean, barely. And she said, no, you can't. Takes them all back. I had to walk out of there in in shame. I was so embarrassed. And that's when I got in the car and just started bawling. And I I think your dad was really upset about that. And yet, what could he do? You know, I couldn't get him. If he would have went back in, he couldn't have gotten him for me because... Yeah, and the store I, wasn't it, close. So, like, we no, lived yeah. in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So, even the temple yeah. was, like, what, a 30, 40-minute drive? Yeah. It was frustrating. Yeah, but. and it's just now hitting me that you have to pay 10% of your income, follow all these rules in order to buy underwear that are required. From them. Just to buy underwear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't yeah. realize that you had to have a temple. I wonder if it's the same. I if you still have to have a recommend in order to buy them. I don't I would think so, but anyone listening I that knows the answer, comment below. I don't I'm know. I'm curious. So um now what like what do you believe or like what makes you happy? What fills you with joy? How are you doing? Are you happier? Um just how how are you doing? Well, I feel like since I've left the church, I feel a sense of freedom. And it's, a, I don't feel the guilt. I don't feel the shame. I don't feel the need to be perfect anymore. I can just be me. Mm-hmm. And if I want to take cookies to the neighbor, I'm just going to take cookies to the neighbor because <laughs> I want to, not because it's the end of the month and I got two days to do it and I've got to hurry and get it in so I can re- meet my quota. I just, I find that I'm a happier person because being honest, I can be up in the mountains. I can be on the beach, I can be sitting in my backyard, and I can feel closer to God or the universe or the spirit or what this higher power, whatever it is, I feel close to that because I'm happy. I'm, I believe heavily in if you just show love to people, 
and you feel love for others, that they're going to show that love back. And isn't that what it's all about? I've read a lot of books on people that have died and come back and died and come back from all religions. And every single book, I kept thinking they're going to tell what church is true. Which one? Come on. Which one is <laughs> yeah. it? And they all say one thing. It's all about love. This unconditional love that they have on the other side. And I think that's what if I can do that and believe I'm I'm not perfect and I have my issues and I have my moments and and but all I can do is say I'm not perfect and I am myself and I'm striving to be a better person. Just being who I am spiritually and letting ho hopefully my higher self guide me to do the things that are right for myself. Yeah. Well, you're doing a great job, Ma. <laughs> It's her birthday today. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if I can. I mean, you were an amazing parent growing up. So I can't say that I ever felt like you shamed me for doing anything wrong as a child, which a lot of people can't say. You know, I, I mm. had friends whose parents were very, very condescending and, and mean and like, you can't do that or you're sinning or you can't wear that. And you always kind of let me take the reins, which I really appreciated. And so I was thinking like, if did did you change as a parent since leaving the church? And I don't think so, because you were always very accepting. Yeah. Except I, now you have cooler clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel more fruit, a little more free, I guess. Yeah. I I after leaving the church, I do feel guilty looking back of thinking I feel bad that I made you kids go to church when you were little. I mean, I did. I would, you know, you're going. You're going where your brothers would go. We're going to dad's this weekend. <laughs> and and I'd say, "Come on, just stay home." Mm -mm, we're going to dad's this weekend. And I know it's they didn't want to go to church all the time. I mean, they loved their dad. Yeah. But I knew that too it was I should have I I think I finally got to the point of, where I said this is your own decision. Yeah. And with your brothers, I never forced them to go on a mission. Right. That was their decision flat out. I wanted that. I'd hoped for that. Mm -hmm. But when they said no, I was like, okay, that's your decision. And so I'm not going to push that. But I sometimes feel guilty that I brought you into this church and hopefully I gave you some good from the church, but then also let you have the freedom to choose and make your own decisions, which obviously you did make your own decision. Yeah. Growing up. But I would never blame you for raising me in this, uh, this thing I like to call a cult. Um, <laughs> because that's how you were raised. And why would you do it any differently? Um, like I was kind of saying before, when, when that's baseline, when that's normal, when that's as baseline as the sky is blue and the grass is green, you have no reason to question it until a storm comes and rips up the grass. And then you go, wait, what's left? What's there? Mm -hmm. And that's really what it takes to to shake you enough to dive into it and look into it because mm -hmm. it's not easy to deconstruct faith. And it's no. not easy to uproot your entire life, to lose friends, to lose family. Um, it's It's difficult. And so... Yeah, I would never blame you for that because it's just how it was and we grew up in Utah. And and I the same would not blame my mother, but my mother, who you know, your grandma is who's will be eighty eight, um, eighty seven. She said, um, just the other day, I wished the if I could change anything in her life, she said, I wished I was not born in Utah and not raised in the church and did not raise my children in the church, that I just raised them to be good, good people. people. And, and because you see people all around the world that are just amazingly good people. And she's and, an amazing and person. And she's an amazing person. Yeah. And, and she's fun and, and feisty and, and yeah. hilarious and yeah. has all the things to say. And I, I remember having like hour long, two hour long conversation. conversation with her when I was kind of going through my whole deconstruction phase. Mm -hmm. I went over to her house and like, grandma did you know this and she's like did you know this no did you know this and <laughs> and we i mean we still talk about that stuff now because that's a, another thing is it's hard to completely drop something when you feel so betrayed when your entire life was devoted to it built on it it's hard to just let it go entirely i think there's always going to be a little bit of that fire there mm -hmm. of you know, feeling betrayed by something and, that you love. And the goodness that comes from that it. That too. Yeah, the, that's the always going to be there. The, the, the camaraderie of having great friends in the church and, and 
again, some that are still in the church and they are wonderful people. And, and I'm happy that they, be, if this is what makes them happy, then that's great because that's, what's hard about leaving the church is you do lose that sense of, uh, friendship with people and you go there every week and it's your social life too, mm -hmm. you know, for the kids too. Yeah. So that's, t that's hard, but. So now we just have to build up our own community of people, which you have been doing. You've been finding people uh -huh. who um, are in deep into like the meditations and the breath works and the stuff that brings mm -hmm. you present, the stuff that evokes love, giving love, receiving love, just being open to all different types of people, not being on that judgmental high horse of, oh, I feel so bad that they aren't of this religion, yeah. but yeah. I'm so happy and I respect you for what you believe and I respect you for what you believe and we can all come together and just be humans together. Yeah. I mean, that's that's all this is. All of us are just having these human experiences and it would just work so much better if we could respect everyone else's <laughs> positions and get along yeah. and, and focus on love, like yeah. you were saying, what Christ actually mm -hmm. taught. Mm -hmm. That's exactly true. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Hmm. Can I do a Linda listen? Oh, she's got a Linda listen. <laughs> I got a Linda listen. Linda listen. What, Wait, do, you, what I, do you got? I have to say it. Linda listen. <laughs> Linda listen. Linda listen. <laughs> Be yourself and just love yourself for who you are. Good, bad, ugly, whatever. All the faults and the great things about yourself. But just be yourself and and look at others the same way and don't judge people and just Linda listen just be be you be you <laughs> be you yes. I love it well mom you were an amazing guest oh I was scared <laughs> you did, did not want to do this because I was really nervous <laughs> really nervous I made her because I knew she had some great things to say that people would love to hear so her Instagram is spirit of otter tail and i'm gonna link it below and she makes incredible native american art we are part cherokee and actually and behind her you can see it's sort of out of focus two of her dream catchers and if you see a giant seven foot white dream catcher in any of my stories that is also for mama she puts healing crystals on them and they're amazing so if anyone wants to connect with this lovely lady and go get some lunch and coffee um <laughs> you can you can reach out to her on her social media. Send her a DM. Like, I, as I like to say, slide into her DMs. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much for joining. Thank you. And for everyone watching, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with our visibility. You can also find me on social media at Colts to Consciousness or reach out by email at Colts to Consciousness at gmail.com.